Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Welcome to the Trinity. We are grateful that you are here worshiping with us. Our worship for today, as it always is, will be the words and prayers or songs and everything is all up on the screens. So follow along there if you want to follow with the musical portions. Those are in the red book in front of you marked worship on the binder. Um, beyond that, this is a service like we've had over the last couple of months. So for those of us who've been here a couple of times, it'll be familiar for everybody else. We will just go with the flow and walk through it together. Um, during our prayers today, we do have a prayer for our veterans, so we will be honoring our veterans during worship today. Otherwise, we are here. Let us begin. rise as you are able. We are gathered in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who receives us in mercy and washes us in grace. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Merciful God, we have not our forgive us, Lord, of our willingness to judge the lives of others. We have not shown kindness to the stranger, nor compassion to the neighbor who lives, loves, or looks different from us. We have not for your forgive us, O oh Lord, of our acceptance of inequality. We have embraced valuing life based on income and ability. We have allowed the uneven distribution of goods, health care, and land. We have not given Forgive us, Lord, of holding close our resources. We have placed expectations in front of gifts. We have resisted your call to be generous and assumed that our lives are of our own creation. People of God, we know all we have done and left undone. 
We also know that God's love is steadfast and mercy endures forever. We are restored to wholeness through Christ who sets us free and makes us a new creation. Breathe easy. You are forgiven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
God is good all the time. Let us pray. God of history, nations will rise and fall. You remain forever, forever faithful to creation. Turn our hope from human systems that fail, that our eyes ever seek your peace and justice. Grant us resolve to live your promises from the sake of our neighbors. In Christ's name we pray. The Gospel according to Luke, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Some people were talking about the temple, how it was decorated with beautiful stones and ornaments and dedicated to God. And Jesus said, as for the things you are admiring, the time is coming when not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. And they asked him, Teacher, when will these things happen? What sign will show that these things are about to happen? And Jesus said, Watch out that you aren't deceived. Many will come in my name, saying, I'm the one, and it's time. Don't follow them. When you hear of wars and rebellions, don't be alarmed. These things must happen first, but the end won't happen immediately. Then Jesus said to them, nations and kingdoms will fight against each other. There will be great earthquakes and wide-scale food shortages and epidemics. There will also be terrifying sights and great signs in the sky, but before all of this occurs, they will take you into custody and harass you because of your faith. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will provide you with an opportunity to testify. Make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. I'll give you words and wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to counter or to contradict. You will be betrayed by your parents, brothers, sisters, relatives, and friends. They will execute some of you. Everyone will hate you because of my name, still, not a hair on your heads will be lost. By holding fast, you will gain your lives. The Gospel of our Lord. My sister and I thought we would do something nice for my folks. So we wanted to get them a computer. It was their 50th anniversary this summer, and, you know, they have one of those computers that could use replacing. So we decided we were going to replace the, their computer, and we talked back and forth. We found one that we thought would, would work. I was the one who ordered it, just because that's the way it works, so that meant it came to my house. I have a friend who's very techy. That's what he's done all of his life. It's not his full-time job, but he kind of keeps up on all the technology. It's his hobby. And so he offered that he would take off all the adware and some of that bloat that comes on a computer that's, you know, how you can get a computer cheaply or at least more affordably. So he was going to clean all that off and then just kind of check it and make sure it works and then give it back to me. Great. It arrived at the end of July. I gave it over to him. You know, it's not his full-time gig to play with computers, so he had some time. But eventually he gave me a call and said, Josh, your computer doesn't work. I said, all right, not ideal, not 
unusual. Here's my ID. So I gave him my ID information because now he's going to impersonate me with the computer company to make it work. So he's calling tech support and the key keeps getting cut off. So I'm getting all these text messages with all these, you know, verification codes, things like that. I keep sending them off to him. But eventually he gets to a point and he was kind of suspicious of this, but he was able to prove that it wasn't a software thing. It's not an update thing. It's there's a piece of equipment in the computer that doesn't work. So he's able to convince tech support of this, great. So they send me a box, because again, it's my computer. So he sends me a box, I throw the computer in the box, send it back off to the repair center. 10 days later, I get the computer back, I hand it over to my friend. He's gonna take all the bloatware off, he's gonna take all of that, he's just gonna make sure it works. Calls me back a few days later, Josh, the computer doesn't work. In fact, it's doing the exact same thing it was doing before, I'm not actually convinced they repaired it. Cool. All right, this is awesome. Feeling pretty good. Bought this thing back in early July. Now we're talking about, no, oh, about mid-September. We're doing great. All right, so he and I decide we're going to sit in the room together with tech support, and they're probably going to make us run through all sorts of diagnostics and things like that, but the plan is that he and I are going to kind of together make this argument that this computer needs to be replaced running through all the diagnostics, and he's talking all the tech chatter with them, and they're going back and forth. But eventually, we're able to power up the computer, and it works. We're able to do a couple things, and it works. By the way, because he's a tech person, he said, I'm suspicious that they got into your computer and they secret squirreled a patch that they're not going to tell us about, but they, they might have you know, magically fixed the computer. So we turn it off. All right, we're all good. Hang up with tech support. I'm going to be going to my folks in a couple of weeks, so I'm going to fire up the computer one more time. I want to run through it, you know, figure out how I'm going to hook up the printer and get them connected to the network, all those sorts of computer things. Open up the computer, fire it up, and I've got a blue screen. It doesn't work. Now, at this point, I'm not using all of my pastor language. I should just be fair. I should also tell you that pastors don't always use pastor language, and I'm very much in the mood to not use any of my pastor language at this moment. So now I'm calling tech support. I get hung up. I call tech support again. I get cut off. I call tech support again. They give me a case number, which is great. I'm making progress. They'll call me in three days. They don't call me back. By the way, I'm starting to write this on my calendar. Call the company to see where we're at. And they only give you one or two numbers. I actually tried to go in through the side door pretending that I'm going to buy a computer and then say, oh, by the way, the one I, don't, I have doesn't work because I have this warranty. It's a 12-month warranty for this computer. Now I want it out of my house. I'm calling them, calling them, calling them. I get case numbers. I get escalated to the complaints department. I get escalated again to resolutions department. It's mid-November and I still have a computer that doesn't work. On the grand scale of all the things, this is not that big, I know. But we've all been stuck in those moments, right? And maybe we're stuck in that moment now of feeling absolutely helpless. There's really nothing I can do. I can't make this computer magically work. I can't seem to call the right numbers and find the right people to make the computer magically work, including the people who gave me this computer that I paid for. So I feel a little helpless. I feel a little chaotic, a little frustrated. And I don't know, maybe it's similar to, you know, when we get a denial of claim from insurance because somewhere, somewhere along the way, someone typed in the wrong address or right, typed in the wrong number in a code of a medical system and now we are on the hook for this treatment that we've received because something isn't working and we're constantly calling back to the doctor's business office or maybe insurance themselves trying to make this thing that should work, work. But it doesn't. Or the moments where we get up in the morning, we've got to go to work because, you know, we've got to go to work. And that's the morning when our car decides that it no longer wants to work. But we've got to get to work because going to work is what pays the bills so that we can continue functioning in our lives. But now we've got to do all these other things to make this car work, hoping that we have a stable enough job that they will understand that our car doesn't work. Or our kids get sick. Or we get sick. Or suddenly we discover problems with the furnace or problems with the air conditioning. All of these things that we have to manage in our lives. And that's just our individual lives where we can find moments where we feel like our lives are out of control and everything is piling up against us. Then you get into all the geopolitical stuff. The war in Ukraine, wars in the continent of Africa, wars in our part of our planet that we'll never hear about because there's no oil under the ground or rare earth metals that we all need for our phones. There are wars and threats of wars anywhere and everywhere. 
And we come to worship this morning feeling a little chaotic, feeling a little helpless, feeling like we need a little bit of a promise of good news. We come to hang out with Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, and we're standing on the front steps and maybe we look up and say, wow, this is kind of a pretty place. And Jesus happens to be standing with us as we're walking into worship and he says, oh yeah, by the way, this is all coming down. Yeah, this building that you really like, it's kind of pretty, it's all coming down. Not one brick will be left upon another, not one stone upon another, it's all gonna be ash and dust. Now that may not necessarily register with all of us, but for some of us, that might actually create heart palpitations. It might cause us to breathe a little bit differently because this isn't just some random dude standing on the front steps with us, this is Jesus. We're in chapter 21 of the Gospel of Luke. Anybody who's hanging out with Jesus up to this point, they've kind of bought into the system. They may not fully believe that Jesus is Son of God because, let's face it, you and I can't fully believe that Jesus is Son of God but we at least believe that Jesus has some sort of a hotline number to God that makes things happen. He speaks for God. So when Jesus says, the temple's coming down, this house of worship that reflects God in our community is coming down, we're gonna feel it. We're gonna sense it. We're gonna trust these words. And now our anxiety level goes up, our sense of helplessness goes up, our fear, our chaos, all of that that swirls around our lives gets elevated. And when we begin to feel helpless, when we begin to feel like our lives are out of control, one of the natural things we're gonna to wanna to do is take control of what we can, which is ourselves. So when we are in the midst of chaos, when we are in the midst of helplessness, when we feel like we can't grasp anything else because we're worn down by geopolitical issues, we're worn down by news of wars across this planet, when we're worn down by the wars that are in our families, in our lives, in this community, we close off. Close ourselves off from our community, close ourselves off from God, close ourselves off from ourselves. Shut the blind, shut the door, lock it all up push everything out of the way. It's a natural reaction. Actually, sometimes it's physiologically a necessary reaction, and at the same time, we're being encountered by Christ, who is speaking these words. He's not speaking them, by the way, to create more fear and anxiety. What he's actually doing is he's naming what we already know. There are already wars and threats of wars. There are already earthquakes floods, another hurricane that hits Florida, wildland fires out west that continue to burn even though we're in November and by now there should be enough snowfall and rain in the air that all of that would have come to an end. Whether we're talking about issues with the climate or we're talking about the challenges that we have in our own homes, Jesus is naming them on the steps of worship as we enter into this space. He's naming for us our sense like everything is crumbling, everything is falling apart and it will all be ash and dust. He's not creating anything new for us. He's stepping into where we already exist. And as Jesus says these words to the disciples and the people outside the temple here in chapter 21, as he says it to us, gathered in this space on this beautiful Sunday morning, in this beautiful space designed to reflect God. And because he's not creating or trying to create more fear for us, what he is inviting us to do is that when we want to close off, and we all want to close off, we want to shut it all out, Jesus is actually inviting us to stand in the chaos because Jesus is in the chaos with us. If we're hanging out with Jesus, it means we're not just talking to some random dude as we know, we're talking to Jesus, the Son of God. And so when we're in conversations with Jesus, he reorients our vision away from our fear, away from our chaos, away from our despair, away from ourselves. He's orienting us around the cross. And when our vision becomes shaped by the cross, then we begin to see that even these words that he offers for us here in chapter 21 are not meant to reflect something that will happen. He's reminding us that this has already happened. Jesus is the temple who goes down into the dust so that we can live. Jesus is the one who goes ahead of us and is arrested and put on trial. So that when the time comes for us to speak God's name in public in the midst of chaos, maybe in the midst of adversaries, 
that we don't have to find the words because Jesus has already spoken the words and he will speak the words through us again. We're being shaped and formed by the cross, which is death and life. It means forgiveness. It means grace. It means redemption. It means recreation, transformation. It reminds us again of the power of God's word that moves through us. It moves through you. That in the midst of the chaos and the despair and the frustration and the fear, in all of our temptation to close off and step away, we are reminded that we are not on our own. Jesus may even be helping us to realize that when we have that moment of helplessness at the foot of the cross, that's not so bad. Because it reminds us again that we are utterly dependent on God. We need God for grace. We need God for compassion, for mercy, to remember again that we are forgiven, that we are loved so absolutely that even the chaos and the fear and the geopolitical forces that circle around us, that it cannot claim us. And if it does not claim us, and it does not claim our neighbors. It does not claim our classmates, our coworkers, our colleagues. It does not claim creation because Christ is with us. Christ goes ahead of us. It's true. Absolutely. God is not telling us that we on our own are going to be able to stop wars and threats of war. You and I are not going to be able to stop the war in Ukraine all by ourselves. We are not going to be able to stop all of the geopolitical movements that we are experiencing in our lives, the rise in authoritarianism, racism, sexism, genderism, anti-Semitism, all of the hate and all of the brokenness and all of the despair. We can't stop it. We can't even stop wildland fires from burning in the West, and we have some of the most skilled firefighters in the world. With that being said, we may not be able to, but we know that God's word brings forth life. We know that God's word brings forth trans transformation, recreation, and you and I are being called on by Christ, shaped by the cross, to stand in the chaos with our neighbors, to stand in the discomfort and the fear, trusting that we have nothing to fear and our neighbors have nothing to fear. We are being called on to speak a word of grace, a word of mercy, a word of justice, a word of equity, a word of peace. God's word in the midst as a promise that God is at work in the midst because God works through our lives. We know this. That's why we show up here. We've been brought here, maybe kicking and screaming, but we have been brought into this beautiful space to be reminded again of the nearness of God to our lives. So Jesus speaks where we are. He names our reality, and he reminds us that we're not alone, that Christ goes with us as Christ goes with our neighbors. Jesus is inviting us. Actually, probably Jesus is calling on us to stand in the midst as God stands with us, to work through the chaos, to proclaim that God is bringing forth life. Amen.
shall reign and Christ shall rule victorious o'er all the world's domain. Gathered as one body, we offer now our prayers on behalf of our community, our neighboring congregations, and all of creation. Let us pray. God with us, we pray for assurance of your unwavering presence. Be with us and surround our neighbors and loved ones with your care. Make visible your love in the midst of chaos and fear, that your compassion be known and your mercy be realized. God with us, we pray for our nation as we continue to evaluate and await the results of our election process. We pray for our elected leaders that they seek peace and humanity for all people. We pray for dignified rhetoric between officials that lowers anger and distrust and, and elevates the need of the vulnerable and any who are without. God with us, we pray for peace and justice in Ukraine. Pray for victims of violence and the mutation mutations of war. We pray for families being separated and children being taken, that these acts of terror cease and restoration be known. God with us, we pray for wisdom as we are reminded of our changing climate that brings stronger storms and greater devastation. We pray for the recovery efforts that will span years in Florida, Puerto Rico, and throughout the Caribbean. Give us courage to seek individual patterns and, co and corporate policies that ensure a healthy planet for the generations that follow. God with us, we pray for all who are sick and suffering. We offer to you now those names aloud or in our hearts. Sean, Wayne and family, John, Margaret, the family of Rose Avery, Gary, Peter, and Ron. Almighty and ever-living God, we give you thanks for the men and women who have served and defended our country and the values of freedom and justice we hold so dear. Help us be mindful of the sacrifices they made and the hardship endured by their families and friends, so that we never take for granted the privileges they have secured for us. Merciful God, you hear our prayers and you respond with the compassion and peace. Trusting you are ever near, we close these prayers together as we say, Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please share that peace with your neighbor. Seated in our space, just a couple of announcements for you. Most of these we can find on our bulletin, um, so I commend that to you if you don't have a copy, but just to pull a couple off so we can see them together and remember them together. Um, right after worship today, you are invited into the fellowship space, coffee space. Um, we will have some intergenerational learning, as we often do nearly every Sunday. Um, we will also have uh, some snacks in there, but we also want you to, if you are able, to come back into this space because we want to have a council forum. It's very simple. We're just trying to maintain communication and transparency. Maybe give, uh, especially if you're newer to our congregation, give you an idea of how our committees work and who does what, you know, names and faces, that sort of thing. But we would love for you to come and hang out with us in this space. So go and get fueled up. If you're going to hang out um, and do some intergenerational learning, please do that. And for everyone else, 
we will be right here shortly after worship. So I commend that to you. Excuse me, beyond that then, we have next Saturday, our women of the ELCA group in this congregation is gonna be gathering up at sunrise in Byron. That uh, it's So Saturday, November 19th at 9 a.m. You can see that again in the bulletin, but I wanna commend that to everyone. Uh, if you would like to come, just call the office and let us know. We just wanna make sure there's a seat available for you that they'll get that all set up for us. It sounds like it's gonna be a really great breakfast not just because the food will be good, not just because it'll be great to have fellowship and get to know some people and maybe see some new faces, but also, as I understand it, you're gonna be hearing from Kay Ray Knowles, who not beyond just being our cantor this morning, also is a music therapist. She has like a really cool job. So if you wanna know anything about what she does in her daily life, her paid gig, if you will, um, come and hear from her, but also it is for the fellowship and for the meal and for all of that time. So please, again, call the office. We want you to show up. We wanna have a spot for you. We wanna ensure that. The only other thing I wanna lift up, and it's actually not on this paper, but just to make you aware, next Sunday, as part of our service, it's Christ the King Sunday, but for those of you keeping track on your liturgical calendars, and I know you all are. Beyond that, we are also gonna offer a healing service. So for those of us who might need an extra word of healing, an extra individual prayer, uh, that, will be, that will be offered to us next week during worship. So I simply wanna make you aware of that. And if you know of folks who might need to hear an extra word of healing and compassion, that will be next week. Friends, will you please rise as you're able? We'll prepare ourselves for communion. Let us pray together. Lord, teach us to be generous. Teach us to serve as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, save that of knowing that we do your will. In your name we pray, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Confident our Lord is at work in this meal, we offer the prayer that he first taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Please rise as you are able. <laughs> Send forth into the world, let us pray. God of abundance, we thank you for the gift of life we share in communion. Guide us toward actions and words that reflect your generosity. Shape our vision to witness your gifts flowing through our neighbors. 
Embolden us to give as we have been given. In Christ's name we pray. People of God, as you walk along with our Lord, reflect with joy on forgiveness through Christ, pray with your neighbors, give thanks for God's grace that gives you new life. Be blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, this day and every day, wherever you may go. Go in peace, serve the Lord.